Hello everyone, it's Mr. Lane here to introduce you to art from ancient Mesopotamia and Persia. So take good notes and let's begin. Ancient Mesopotamia, key ideas. First, systematic record of human development took place. Humans learned how to control the wheel and plow, control floods, and construct irrigation canals, to name a few. Writing, we will have more knowledge of the way of life, art, and the culture, how it was during that time. Trade and specialization, more coherent narrative art arises. A common theme was war. The art also more organized. Buildings were used for religion. Some common themes include hybrid guardian figures and artwork commemorating the achievement of rulers. Royal patrons like kings are going to be commissioning a lot of the art. Let's look at some advances from the Stone Age. More humans are going to be depicted and they're going to be wearing clothes, which because of that, we're going to have more information about their customs and social class. They'll be seen in action poses. There'll be improved accuracy, but we'll still see the composite views. There'll be decorated living spaces and they're no longer a nomadic society. So there's less movement and people are staying in one place for longer periods of time. Trade's going to take place and we'll see that through the example of cylinder seals. Here are the key terms that we will discuss throughout the lesson. Here's a list of all the art pieces you will learn about. Why do we call this part of the world Near East? The terms Near East and Middle East were coined regarding their position from Europe. Furthermore, the terms related to the geographical locations of the regions that they covered. The Near East comprised the Ottoman Empire and the Balkans. Generally, the countries in Western Asia, which were between Iran and the Mediterranean Sea, formed the Near East. These included Egypt, Iraq, Israel slash Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. However, the term was rendered obsolete when the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1918. I'm gonna give you a little bit more information, geographically speaking, because it's important to us to know how these people survived and got here. The Fertile Crescent is the region where the first settled agricultural communities of the Middle East and Mediterranean Basin are thought to have originated by the early 9th millennium BCE. Throughout the region, irrigation is necessary for the best agricultural results and indeed is often essential to any farming at all. The ancient countries of the Fertile Crescent, such as Sumer, Babylonia, Assyria, and Egypt, are regarded as some of the world's earliest complex societies. Some important cities and regions to know include Sumer, Akkad, Mesopotamia, Babylon, and Europe. The 19th century excavations opened up public eye to art in the ancient Near East. Most reliefs depicting warfare and hunting statues of human-headed bulls are found from palaces of the Assyrians, for example. Here's a list of the different ruling groups that we will be looking at. Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Hittite, 
Assyrian, and Persian. If you would like to learn more about the ancient Mesopotamian society, watch the Crash Course video Mesopotamia. Very informative and fun. Give it a try. Try writing in cuneiform. Here's the alphabet for you and some example words you can write. Like for instance, welcome to Mesopotamia. Go for it. The development of cuneiform marked the beginning of writing. Some of the oldest written documents known were found in Sumer, the first group we'll talk about here soon. Some of the documents included records of administrative acts and commercial transactions, inventories of cattle, food, and other items that they made by scratching pictographs into soft clay. Now there were some advantages of this writing system, but there were also some disadvantages. So for instance, not everyone benefited from the development of writing. It created class distinctions because not everyone could write. It also widened the gap between classes. The Epic of Gilgamesh is often referred to as the earliest great work of literature that has survived into the modern age. It is more than 4,000 years old. Gilgamesh is a king of Uruk and slayer of monster Husawa. To get the full story about the Epic of Gilgamesh, Here's another Crash Course World History Mythology video for you to watch. The Sumerians existed between 3500 to 2332 BCE. Ancient Sumer corresponds to southern Iraq today. The Sumerians found the world's first city-states and invented writing, which we talked about. Sumerian builders construct the oldest Mesopotamian temples on lofty platforms. Sumerian artists present narratives in a register format, which we'll later discuss as well. Our first art piece, statues of two worshipers from the square temple at Esnuna modern Tel Asmar, Iraq, around 2700 BCE, made from gypsum, shell, and black limestone. The man is two feet four inches high and the woman is one foot 11 inches high. A votive figure is one who offers prayers. And that's what these figures are doing. They're offering prayers to the gods. They serve as a stand-in for a donor or a worshiper. There also are inscriptions surrounding these statues which account for what the donor did in the God's honor. They would have filled an entire room or shrine. Access to the small central shrines were probably limited. Most likely the priest who served the God's needs could enter. It was perhaps due to this lack of access that the elite commissioned images of themselves to be carried into the God's presence. These statues embody the very essence of the worshiper so that the spirit would be present when the body physically was not. Hierarchy of scale is a term used where you see important figures depicted larger and typically in the center, as you can see here. Maybe these people are larger because they paid more money or they're of a higher status, like a priest. 
Their hands are in the prayer gesture. And again, they were placed in temples to represent the mortals, or shrines, as we mentioned earlier. These were found beneath a temple at Eshnuna, buried, which would have been a proper disposal of the objects. Maybe they were buried after the donor died. The mortals represented with the hands in the gesture of prayer. Maybe they would have originally held something like beakers for pouring a ritual liquid. More about the physical characteristics of the statues. They're between 12 to 30 inches tall. The men were bare chested with a kilt slash fringe skirt, some type of skirt. You see their beards really long and they have shoulder length hair. Women have their left shoulder covered with a long robe and their right one bare. The general shape of the forms are cones and cylinders, the forms of their body. Only slaves would have been nude and they would have been placed on stands. If we look at their eyes, their eyes stand out really prominently. That exaggeration is to serve the purpose of depicting the eternal wakefulness of the donor, which is necessary to fulfill their duty to their God of being awake and alert and being able to worship. Their heads are tilted upward in anticipation for the waiting room of the divinity. They're not portraits, so they would not have been accurate depictions of the donor. And there also is a sense of emotionlessness in their face. Next is the standard of your from tomb 779, Royal Cemetery, Ur, modern Tel Makayar, Iraq, around 2600 to 2400 BCE, made from wood, lapis lazuli, shell, and red limestone. Eight inches by one foot, seven inches. Ur was the city home to biblical Abraham. Interesting fact. The function is unknown, and perhaps it was placed on a pole, or it could have been carried like a standard, which was a symbol of war. It was found in a rich tomb with lots of bodies. The tomb had gold helmets, daggers with handles of lapis lazuli, golden beakers, jewelry, and other luxury items. Musicians, servants, and soldiers would also have been buried because they were sacrificed for kings and queens during that time. It has a rectangular face and a trapezoidal um, shape. It was excavated by Leonard Woodley, a British archeologist. One side has the theme of war. Here it is read from left to right and bottom to top. At the very bottom, you see chariots who are running over their enemies, killing them. In the middle are the soldiers who are, have their enemies uh, captured, so they're taking them into captivity. The very top Soldiers are presenting the, the, brown, the bound captives to their, their king. Some of the captives are stripped naked as a form of, de of degradation. And the theme of the standard in general is about the duties of war. So the military leader he has a role as a mediator between the humans and the gods. That's what they saw him as. There's also going to be some music 
um, that is going to be involved in the kind of like form of, form of a celebration, a court entertainment. We also see hierarchy of scale used. As you can see at the very top in the very center, the king's head breaks the frame. The peace side shows gifts being brought to the ruler for the afterlife. So at the very bottom, you see men who are carrying provisions, maybe spoils of war, prizes, plunder. In the middle, there are animals who could also have been spoils of war and fish, which they will be celebrating their great banquet, depicting in the uppermost section where they have a giant feast with the king. The interpretation is a victory celebration and a banquet. Within the standard of Ur, we see these three narrative devices being used. One is the register. Those are a horizontal band containing decorative or narrative imagery. As you can see here, the divisions. The term is normally used when a work of art is organized in multiple horizontal bands. Hierarchy of scale, which we mentioned earlier, we'll just review it, is a system used to visually communicate power in Egyptian as well as the art of other cultures, including the ancient Near East, for example. So the significance of important individuals such as a pharaoh were depicted as being much larger than any figures, any other figures in the scene. And these figures were also placed in the center. Lapis lazuli is a deep blue opaque gemstone used in antiquity and continuously used throughout the generations. It still continues to be popular today and remains one of the most important opaque gemstones. Lapis lazuli is chiefly composed of the mineral lazurite with additional other minerals including white calcite and sparkling specks of pyrite. And in this case they found them in Afghanistan and used them on the standard of your in the background. Here we revisit the composite view or twisted perspective as we saw in some of the caves from the art from the Stone Age. Again, it's a convention of representation in which part of a figure is shown in profile and another part of the same figure is shown frontally. The ziggurat was one of the world's first great architectural structures. These Mesopotamian temple platforms are called ziggurats, a word derived from the Assyrian ziggurat meaning high. The gods had a central role in the life, the daily life of the Mesopotamians. So on the ziggurat, for example, the god would visit the earth and the priests climbed to the top. As you can see, there's some stairs leading up to the top of the ziggurat to worship. The idea that gods reside above the world of humans is central to most religions in our world today. Also, the main temple to each state's chief god formed the city nucleus during this time. The ziggurats were symbols in themselves, for example, made to represent a, a mountain in that, that idea. Here we have a restored view of the White Temple, Europe, modern Warka, Iraq, around 3200 to 3000 BCE. Europe was a city made up of 1,000 acres. The temple you see here was dedicated to the sky god Anu. 
Each city-state, which I'll define here shortly, was under the protection of a god. For example, Inanna, the god of love and war, was the god of love and war. A city-state, the single city of a city-state functions as the center of political, economic, and cultural life. It's an independent country that exists completely within the borders of a single city. It was a Sumerian invention. The rulers and priests governed communal activities and each city-state was under the protection of a different Mesopotamian de deity. And we know this from information from cuneiform documents. This temple was around 40 feet high. This is what's left from the White Temple of Uruk that we just saw the image of. It's made from mud brick and they would maintain it by adding new coats of mud plaster at least every year. It has a bent axis plan that incorporates two or more angular changes of direction, which was characteristic of Sumerian architecture. The corners are oriented toward cardinal points, the compass. We mentioned that it was originally 40 feet high. There's something known as a cella, which was the main room at the top of the temple. You can see it here in the little image on the bottom left. Sacrifices were made before the statue of gods. They believed the deity would descend from heaven. There was furniture inside, offering tables, places for fires, liquid storage. They also stored agricultural products for the god Inanna and were uncertain if it had a roof. Moving now to the Akkadians, whom existed between 2332 to 2150 BCE. The Akkadians became the first Mesopotamian rulers to call themselves kings and have themselves depicted in art with divine attributes. The Akkadians introduced a new concept of royal power based on unswerving loyalty to the king rather than to the city-state. Here we have another ziggurat. Take a moment and pay attention to the title so you don't confuse this one with the ziggurat of Uruk. This is a ziggurat looking southwest of Ur, modern Tel Makayar, Iraq, around 2100 BCE. Also known as the Great Ziggurat, this was one of the largest and best preserved ziggurats, originally between 70 to 100 feet high. The lower portion of the ziggurat, which supported the first terrace, would have used some 720,000 baked bricks. Ziggurats are found scattered around what is today Iraq and Iran. The core of the ziggurat is made of mud brick, brick made from baked mud. This one was dedicated to the moon goddess Nana, the patron god of the city of Ur. The temple at the top that did not survive, um, you can see it there. To visit the ziggurat at Ur was to seek both spiritual and physical nourishment. The ziggurat at Ur has been restored twice. In the 1980s, Saddam Hussein restored the facade of the massive lower foundation of the ziggurat, including the three monumental staircases leading up to the gate the first terrace. Since this most recent restoration, however, the ziggurat at Ur has experienced some damage. 
During the recent war led by American and coalition forces, Saddam Hussein parked his MIG fighter jets next to the ziggurat, believing that the bombers would spare them for fear of destroying the ancient site. Hussein's assumptions proved only partially true as the ziggurat sustained some damage from American and coalition bombardment. Here's a link to a brief video you can watch previously shot from Fox News about the ziggurat of Ur in Iraq. Also, I think it's important for us to express our heartfelt condolences to all those who lost their lives as a result of the Iraq war. Next, there is the victory stele of Naram Sin, 2254 to 2218 BCE, made from pink limestone, six feet, seven inches high. As mentioned earlier, within the Akkadians, there is a shift in the concept of royal power where there is loyalty to the king, not the city-state. The governors are considered servants to the king. Naram Sin, as you see in the title here, was the great-grandson of Akkadian king Sargon, the founding king of the Akkadians. We see here the first time that artists rejected the standard way of telling a story that had been the rule for a millennium. So this piece was made to commemorate King Akkad who defeated the Lulubi people of the Iranian mountains to the east. He has a horned helmet that signifies his divinity. This is also the first time the king appears as a god in Mesopotamian art. You see he's scaling the heavens on a ziggurat and the sun god at the top guides him to victory. The Babylonians existed between 2150 to 1600 BCE and they are going to introduce us to a very important law code. The stele with law code of Hammurabi from Susa, Iran, around 1780 BCE, made from basalt, 7 feet 4 inches high. Hammurabi was the sixth Babylonian king. The goal of a law is to maintain stability of society more than to protect the weak. The laws were written down so they can be seen as more partial, less flexible, and as divine in this case. There were around 282 laws with scaled punishments. The stele included 3,500 cuneiform letters written in Akkadian. These laws governed all aspects of Babylonian life, like commerce, marriage, property, murder, inheritance, slave ownership, infidelity, and money lending, to name a few. A relief in sculpture figures projecting from a background of which they are part, as you can see here on the stele. The degree of relief is de designated high, low, or sunken. In the last, the artist cuts the design into the surface so that the highest projecting parts of the image are no higher than the surface itself. So this is an example of a relief. Here is a small sample of the infractions described and the penalties imposed from the law code of Hammurabi, which I'll let you read on your own. King Hammurabi is on the left and Shamash, the sun god, is on the right. Shamash 
has the flame shoulders, signifying him as a sun god. The king, Hammurabi, raises his hand in respect, a sign of respect. Shamash is handing the king tools of the rod and ring, which signify authority. These are the builder's tools. So the king has power to build social order, hand down punishments, make laws. Hammurabi also, not Hammurabi, Shamash, the god has the headdress that signifies him also as a god. His feet, the god's feet are on many mountains. You know, of course they're you know, seen, seen as sitting on the throne. Hammurabi also can be seen as a semi-divine divine priest slash king status because he's shown in the same presence as Shamash. We can also see twisted perspective used here, our composite view. When you look at their beards and their, their heads, the direction that they are facing. This image just shows you the scale of the stele in real life. This is an image of the cuneiform text zoomed in that's on the face of the law code. The Assyrians were a vanquished, warfaring people that succeeded the Babylonians and Hittites. They were around between 1600 to 612 BCE. Here is a Lamassu, man-headed winged bull from the citadel of Sargon II, Dur Shamrukan, Iraq, around 721 to 705 BCE, limestone, 13 feet by 11 by 10 inches high. The citadel of Sargon II was necessary for the Assyrians because they were in constant warfare. For the first time, life was regularized with division of labor and communal efforts such as defense and public works projects. Sargon II moved the capital and built a new palace, the House of Sargon. It included religious buildings, residences, and services for the king. The palace was a fortified platform around 40 feet tall. The gate had flanking Lamasa, Lamasu creatures, which we'll talk about next. The Lamasu you see here is 14 feet tall. He has the head of a man the body of either a lion or a bull, and the wings of an eagle. He's wearing the three-horn headdress of a god, and you can see his strength. The bones and muscles are shown in detail under his skin. He has a fifth leg. If you look closely at his legs, there are five. So from one angle, you see him with five legs, and from the other angle he has four. This was done to show him in movement, in a striding position, kind of like an optical illusion idea. That was our last stop for the Assyrians. The Achaemenid Empire existed between 604 to 559 BCE. Here is where the Persians built an immense palace complex at Persepolis. This is a view of Persepolis looking west with the Apadana, which is a royal audience slash throne hall in the background. Located in Iran, around 521 to 465 BCE. 
Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon in 539 BCE. The city is officially founded by Darius I in 518 BCE, southwestern Iran today. It mainly consists of limestone and it included ceremonial and administrative buildings. This complex was heavily fortified. Around 480 BCE, the Persians were the largest empire in history. What we see on Persepolis is a really good example of a hypostyle hall, a room with a roof supported by columns. This image and the next two are just for your own observation. There is a documentary about ancient Persia in Persepolis that you can watch linked right here. Thanks for watching everyone. Whatever you do, do it well. Walt Disney.